Everything is racist. Every thought you have is a KKK dream. Everything is racist. White supremacist extreme. Ah, yes, it's a brand new day, and that means it's time to find something to call racist and be angry about. Now, I know it's Thursday, but today we're going to talk about how racist Wednesday is. Not the day of the week, although I'm sure there's a liberal out there who feels that way, but no, the new classic reboot of the classic Adams Family character, Wednesday. Yes, Tim Burton's Wednesday has been called racist for casting black actors as bullies. Black actors as bullies, that the horror. Everyone knows that bullies can only legally be portrayed by the guy who played Johnny Lawrence in The Karate Kid. Mm -hmm, that's it. Uh, I mean, are you trying to put him out of business? This is really the only gig he's got at this point. Cobra Kai all the way. And remember, that dude, totally white, by the way. I don't know if anyone remembers this. Anyway, whatever part of the left that is still on Twitter went into conniptions over the casting, the only thing I really hate about Wednesday and most young adult Netflix shows is how the antagonist is almost always a young black woman troublemaker. It's not lost on me, and I just wanted to name that I see it. Ugh, the way progressives talk. Okay, thanks, Dr. John Paul, host of the my, one of my favorite podcasts, the Black Fat Femme podcast. I can name things that I see too. Mug, pen, camera, idiotic liberal outrage. So let's break this down quickly and make sure we really understand the issue here. Human Muppet baby Tim Burton is a racist because he gave paid acting jobs to people of color. Netflix is racist because its entire business model is to churn out crappy woke content at a pace that would make Stephen King's head spin. I'm a racist because I didn't realize there was a new Adams Family spinoff in the first place. And of course, you, you, America, you are the most racisty of all, because even with all of the bitching about how black people are portrayed on the show, you still didn't tune in to support their struggle against the systemic racism of the film industry or, or something. But wait, no, actually, more people watched it uh, than even Stranger Things, which is incredible. <laughs> is there this much pent up passion for the Adams family that I was not aware of? Who knows? I guess all the racism wasn't that big of a deal after all. As it turns out, the idiots of the internet are wrong again. But even if we disproved racism this one time, we can never, ever forget. Everything is racist. Every thought you have is a KKK dream. Everything is racist. White supremacist extreme. Get your Christmas presents. Get your Christmas presents. StuDoesMerch.com. Use the code Stu20. Get 20% off everything in the store. Do it now. If you're watching on YouTube, like this video right now. Follow the channel. Click the bell. Do all the things. We appreciate it. James Altucher is going to join us today to tell us what he would do if he were Elon Musk. Joe Biden is facing criticism over butter poached Maine lobster and caviar. But we start by doing the Disney downfall. Yes, how does a company that seemed like they were on the top of the world just a couple of years ago have this awful downfall over the past couple of years? Now, I could tell you this. A lot of like people would like to, to name the CEO that is no longer with us. Uh, that's unfortunate. And we can get into that here in just a second. But I want to also talk about where things are today with this particular com company. Let me tell you, start with a story from this weekend. I was, uh, I was home after Thanksgiving. It's a Friday after Thanksgiving. In Dallas, it's cold, uh, you know, cold for us. It's like 50 degrees. It's cold and it's rainy and it's sort of miserable. The kids can't go outside. They just want to sit on their, t on their screens and, you know, uh, play with their iPads and not do anything for the whole day. And I understand, you know, there's nothing wrong with a lazy day every once in a while. But we're all kind of in a food coma. This is probably not the healthiest way to live. And I thought to myself, I really should get these kids out of the house. And I thought to myself, what can we do? You know, it's too 
rainy and awful to be outside doing anything. And I thought, well, I'm incredibly lazy. What if we take them to a movie? This is the parenting dream. You go to a movie. Now, at least down here in Texas, I know they're all over the country, but down here in Texas, there's like dine-in theaters on every corner. And I love the dine-in theater experience. It's it's sort of the ultimate thing to do. You go there, you watch a movie, you sit back in a recliner, you get food brought out to you, you get to have the, the tasty treats uh, with the snacks and the big sodas, and it's just, I mean, it's a great experience. So I go to the movie theater, or I'm going to go to the movie theater, I'm thinking to myself, I'll go to anything at a movie theater because I don't even care about the movie. I just want to be at the theater eating all the food. So I look on my uh, little uh, movie app, and I look for whatever kid movie just came out. Whatever one's out, we'll just go see that. And I see something called Strange World. Now, this is from Disney. And right before I'm about to click on the times to see what time this thing's going to be on so I can take the kids, I think to myself, can I trust Disney? Can I trust Disney anymore? Is there, is it okay, because this is the way it used to be, it used to be, you saw Disney on the label. You saw Disney on the commercial. You knew that movie was going to be something safe for your kids. That's just the way it operated. That was a brand name. You knew it would be good. They had a real reputation for good quality content that was safe for children. But then I thought to myself, you know, this is 2022. I, I don't think I could just trust Disney blindly anymore. I'm not an idiot. So I decided to watch the trailer of the movie, the movie called Strange World. Let me give you a taste of what it looked like. Walt Disney Animation Studios proudly presents Strange World, a new motion picture event. Brace yourself! Travel past space and time to a place of infinite mystery, unlike anything you've ever seen. Where in the world are we? What in the... We are in way over our heads. I'm not an explorer. I'm a farmer. Okay, so what's that movie about? I don't know. Just a bunch of weird, it's about a strange world. A bunch of kind of cool, weird-looking characters. Maybe some adventure mixed in. Really no details at all about the plot, but, you know, looks kind of cool. Kind of, you know, colorful and amazing. A perfect thing to fall asleep to after you finish your popcorn. And then... I was just about to click on the times to see what time this movie was going to play, and I realized, wait a minute, I should check the reviews to make sure, because I still don't, they didn't show anything offensive there, but I don't know. What could this actually be? Is this some weird indoctrination thing? I never know with Disney these days. And that's something that the Disney stockholders should understand, that this is how parents feel. They think to themselves, I can't trust Disney anymore. I can't. That's what you've done to this company. But beyond that, I decided to click on the reviews. Let me give you a taste. From Vulture. If only this environmentally focused adventure fe featuring a queer black teenager were as audacious as its themes. Apparently, not only uh, is it obviously a super woke movie, but it's also uh, not all that good. Uh, it also bombed at the box office and looks to lose maybe $100 million in its theatrical run. But I don't want to even focus on that. Uh, number one, can we just have stuff that's safe for kids? Do I really need to get environmental indoctrination in my movies? Do I really need to get a story? Why would I need to know the sexuality of the characters in a kid's movie? Uh, they don't need to have sex. They don't need to be interested in sex. They don't need to be queer or straight. They don't need to be anything. They need to be cartoon characters in a strange new world. They don't, we, we don't need any of this. And to be honest about it, that's not even the worst part here. The worst part is they tried to hide it. In none of the actual uh, news about this, uh, none of the, in, in the trailer, you don't see any word about it being an environmentally themed queer black teenager movie. It just seemed like it was a movie starring some kids that were doing some cool things. 
They, they knew it would be offensive to half the country, so they just hid it. This makes it much, 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 much worse, of course. And of course, this is apparently standard now. That, that headline I just gave you, it's from their uh, Facebook page from Vulture. And a lot of publications on the conservative side picked this quote up, saying, you know, queer black teenager, environmentally focused uh, adventure, and just saying how this is another woke Disney thing. Well, when you click on this article now, this review, they've actually changed the language. The vulture changed the language of their own review to make sure, I guess, what, conservatives couldn't take advantage of how stupid the movie looked after that description? Well, apparently that's where we are in this society. And it's a really sad time. It's a sad thing to look at. This is Disney. This is an American institution. It's not, it's not just some entertainment company. It's a, it's a real pillar of American culture that has been destroyed by the last couple of CEOs. And, of course, we now know that these, uh, the two Bobs are a big storyline in Hollywood right now. Now, Bob Iger was the old CEO. Bob Chapik came in. He did a couple of years. Then he was thrown out the other day. And Bob Iger is coming back in. And, you know, there was a, uh, an interview with Bob Iger, kind of an all-hands meeting, where he was asked a bunch of questions about where this would go. And a lot of the commentary about it was, well, he's backing off the political stances. He sees what's going on. He sees that Disney's been screwed up by all these woke stances all the time. And he's going to turn the company around. That's what's going on here. I don't think that's right. Let's listen to some of the commentary from uh, Bob Iger. And you tell me, is he trying to back off of his old positions or is he just a really good CEO that is using CEO speak to, again, hide what they're doing? Many cast members had wished that Disney stayed out of politics. Will Disney stay out of making political statements? You know, I think uh, there's a miss perception here about what politics is. And I think that some of the subjects that have proven to be controversial as it relates to Disney have been branded political, and I don't necessarily believe they are. I don't think when you are telling stories and attempting to be a good citizen of the world that that's political. Just not how I view it. Do I like the company being embroiled in controversy? Of course not. It can be distracting and it can have a negative impact on the company. And to the extent that I can work to kind of quiet things down, I'm going to do that. But I think it's, it's important to put in perspective what some of these subjects are and not just simply brand them political. That's not him saying uh, he's going to back off of all of this nonsense. That's the opposite. Yeah, he's saying I don't want to be in controversy. And of course, I, I can work to try to quiet things down. But let's be honest about it. He's going farther than that. He's saying there's a misperception about what politics is. In other words, my, my chosen issues, the LGBTQQIA2 plus community, environmental indoctrination, all of that is so right. I'm so right on it. It's so clearly the right way to go that it's above being political. It's not political when it's, there's just truth and, and hate. He's saying you shouldn't think about this as a left-right issue. You should think about it as me being right and you being wrong. He's saying that in a very sly CEO way, but that's what he's saying here. He even goes on to say um, it's important to uh, put in perspective what some of these subjects are. And he says, I don't think when you're telling stories and attempting to be a good citizen of the world, that's political. In other words, if you take the stances that I like, they're so correct, they can't possibly be considered political. Do you think he means uh, old-timey conservative values, traditional values, when he's talking about being a good citizen of the world? Uh, no, I don't think so. But he went on, and they asked him about the uh, uh, incorrectly named Don't Say Gay bill in Florida. What is your stance on the Don't Say Gay situation? Well, first of all, uh our LGBTQ employees are very important to us and we care deeply about them. That is a given. Um, secondly, this company has been telling stories for 100 years and those stories have had a meaningful, positive impact on the world. And one of the reasons they've had a meaningful, positive impact is because one of the core values of our storytelling is inclusion and acceptance and tolerance. And we can't lose that. We just can't lose that. I think, about, I think about Black Panther and the impact that had on the world, or a film like Coco. I mean, I could go on and on. 
and how we actually change the world for the good. It must continue. We also, when you tell stories, it's a delicate balance. You're talking to an audience, but it's also important to listen to an audience. It's important to have respect for the people that you're serving, that you're trying to reach, and not have disdain for it. Uh, it would be a nice improvement if Disney did not have disdain for half the country, but I don't think that's what he's going over here. I mean, the company has been telling stories for 100 years. That's true. They have been telling stories for 100 years. It's what's made them one of the most giant media behemoths the globe has ever seen. It's responsible for all of their success. Storytelling is key, of course, to Disney. But it was telling stories that were safe for families, that were kid-friendly, that did not bring up controversial topics. You know, Bambi dying in, a w in the woods, you know, that was sad, but it wasn't a controversial topic. That's not what we're supposed to be doing here. I want to bring my kids, let me handle the parenting. You can entertain my kids for 90 minutes every couple months. Let me handle the par parenting. Let me handle this. They don't want that to be the case. They say, the, uh, and, and of course, they go on about, uh, well, we're doing storytelling, but our storytelling must have a positive influence on the world. Uh, we talk, when that, what is that positive in, uh, in, uh, influence? A, a positive impact when it comes to inc uh, inclusion, acceptance, and tolerance. And I think about Black Panther, which, should you think about that? Because I know it made a lot of money, but good God, let's be honest about it. That was terrible. I mean, we all we all recognize that was terrible. You want to have a a, a, a a super now I should point out I don't like any of these superhero movies. So that's I'm probably not the best judge. But I did try to watch about 15 minutes of this thing. Oh, my God. It's just absolutely horrid. It's got nothing to do with Black Panther being uh, uh, portrayed by a black ac actor or any of that nonsense. That's fine. Uh, who cares? That's that's great. Um, there's no problem with that. Uh, it's just the movie was bad. But that's just a totally different story. It's true they did 100 years of storytelling. It's true that they built a media behemoth. It's true that they built a pillar of American culture at Disney. They did this over a long period of time. But how did they do it? Did they do it by preaching to their audience? Did they do it by insulting to the, their audience? Did they do it by trying to fool their audience by not telling them what the movies were about until they got into the theater and got all pissed off about it? That's not how they did it. They did this for 100 years of consistency. Even when the movies weren't great, you knew at least they were going to be safe for your kids. You never had to worry about bringing your kids to a Disney movie. Now, Disney has spread out to so many different platforms, so many different things that they're doing. You know, if I were CEO of Disney, my message would be a little different. It would be a little different. I would say, hey, uh, all those woke employees out there, let me just lay this out for you. If you want to make movies for people for families that they're going to enjoy, that are going to be safe for families. If you're going to make movies that kids can go to and not have to uh, have lengthy, uncomfortable conversations with their parents on the way out when they're overinflated with soda and popcorn. You want to do that? You're welcome to stay. We'd love it. If what you want to do is make hidden environmental propaganda about black queer teenagers... You can do that. And let me give you the path on how you do that. What you do, number one, you stay here. You make some good movies for families. And then you take all the money you made and you go make your own movie somewhere else. That's one option. Number two, we own almost the entire media landscape. You know, it, it, it's always sunny in Philadelphia has a podcast out. Uh, and I was listening to an episode of it the other day. They're on FX, which is owned by Disney. Meaning that it's always sunny in Philadelphia. One of the most offensive shows in the media is owned by Disney. And there's plenty of room for creativity in, in other realms that don't ruin the Disney brand. No one says, oh, well, that FX show ruins the Disney brand. We all understand that they make some stuff for adults, some stuff for kids. But when it's got that Disney brand on it, it's supposed to mean something. And that's going to hurt that brand over and over and over again when they do crap like this. And the messaging from Bob Iger, while he is very, very... Um, very, very well-spoken as a CEO, and he's able to bring calm to a company that's going through a lot of stuff. It's the same pitch of the same stuff. We don't need to be lectured by Hollywood millionaires. We don't need to do that. We've seen what these people are like. We've watched all the Me Too accusations come out. Over a lot of these people, we were supposed to be listening to their morals and values. Nobody's fooled by this anymore. Just do your job. Do the Bill Belichick thing. Do your job. Show up. 
give quality content to kids, safe content for families, cash all the checks you want to do by that procedure, because there's a lot to be cashed. If you stop insulting your audience, and even worse, trying to indoctrinate your audience, and even worse than that, hiding it from parents, you're going to continue to have the same disastrous run that has accompanied your past couple of years. Let me tell you about Bespoke Post. Bespoke Post, uh, um, they partner with small businesses and kind of emerging brands to bring you the most unique goods every single month. No matter what you have going on in the winter, Box of Awesome, that's their big product, comes, uh, comes out every month. Um, and they have them through a bunch of different categories from cozy essentials to travel must-haves to cocktail kits. They've got everything you will need for the winter. Now, if you go to uh, boxofawesome.com, you get started. You could take the quiz there. Your answers will help pick the right box of awesome to you, for you because they give them you know, a bunch of different categories. So you can get all sorts of stuff. Like if you like, you know, camping. If you like, uh, you know, uh, if you like uh, maybe coffee. If you like uh, maybe cool uh, alcohol. Uh, you know, if you like to make drinks at home, whatever you like to do. Um, you can go to Box of Awesome and get some really cool stuff that you probably didn't even know existed. This is why this is the ultimate gift, especially for any guy that you, that you have to buy for this, this holiday season. Go on there, get them to fill out the, the survey, or you fill it out for them. Each box is valued at around 70 bucks, but you only pay a fraction of that price. And every time I've re ever received a Box of Awesome, it's been much more than $70. You can uh, skip a month at any time. It's free to sign up. You can cancel whenever you want. You get 20% off your first monthly Box of Awesome when you sign up at boxofawesome.com. And you enter the code STU at checkout. It's boxofawesome.com. The code is STU. Get 20% off your first box. Boxofawesome.com. Code is STU. Happy to welcome James Altucher back to the program. He's an entrepreneur and host of The James Altucher Show, which you can subscribe, subscribe to now wherever you get your podcasts. James, how's it going? Good, Stu. Thanks for having me on Stu Does America. Yeah, we appreciate it. Appreciate you taking the time. Uh, I wanted to come to you because I, I, I want to start maybe with the 50,000-foot view of what has gone on over the past month with FTX. I, you know, a lot of people maybe didn't, you know, maybe they're not even into crypto at all, but I think this has now crossed the barrier of, of, of newsworthiness to people who are not even interested in the industry. If you had to summarize this for people, what happened at FTX? Basically, you have this crypto exchange, or it could be an exchange for anything, but it happens to be a crypto exchange that was completely unregulated, located in the Bahamas, you know, put money in at your own risk. The Bahamas is not known as this center for crypto exchanges. It's it's basically a place you go to do things somewhat illegal. And uh, it was a fraud. So essentially what happened was Sam Bankman Freed, who was who started uh, FTX, he would take customer money and do whatever he wanted with it. He had a hedge fund on the side called Alameda. He would invest money in Alameda. Alameda made horrible investments. The bank called up Alameda and said, hey, you need to put up some money. You lost a lot of money. We need $8 billion back. And Sam Bankman Fried said, no problem. I've got all my customers on F the FTX side. They won't know. And he mm -hmm. took all that money from FTX and put it in Alameda. And then they both went out of business. <laughs> I mean, it really, and it happened so quickly. This was really like, of course, the the the, the media darling, at least, as it came when it came to crypto exchanges. Yeah. Obviously, they spent all this money on Super Bowl ads with Larry David and all of this. And to see it come crashing down this fast is shocking. It's almost more shocking, though, to see after all of this has gone down that he's decided this week to do interviews with, I think, everybody who asks. <laughs> he's all of a sudden everywhere trying to talk his way out of this. And when you're having legal problems, that doesn't seem like a good idea. Well, there's a lot of interesting things here because, A, it was a total mess. Right now, they're, they're inside FTX. They're looking at it. There was no risk controls. The money was just like, it was as if it was his own personal pocketbook. Like if you put money in FTX to buy Bitcoin, for instance, it was as if you were giving money to some kid to get private jets and apartments and girlfriends and whatever. His, his family is extremely politically connected. Uh, his parents are, are 
professors who were involved in various Democratic campaigns. He was the second largest donor after George Soros to the, the Democratic midterm elections. So he probably thinks he's a little bit protected politically. Also, the company was in the Bahamas. So there's a lot of gray areas legally and crypto exchanges haven't been the most regulated things in the world. I do think I for I'm a believer in the long-term future of crypto. But you know, you, you you know, there has to be regulations. There has to be some protection of the customer in order for crypto to get widespread acceptance. If you have people just throwing money into the Bahamas, it's buyer beware at this point. So it was it was definitely a mess, but don't forget just because an industry is starting, there's always something that happens at the beginning of an industry. You have you have unregulated natural gas derivatives, and suddenly you have Enron, which is a fraud. That didn't end the energy industry. It just happened. Bernie Madoff didn't end the hedge fund industry. Hedge funds are bigger than ever, but this fr fraud unfortunately happened. WorldCom didn't end telecom, but that fraud happened. And on and on. I can go back all the way to central banks in France in the 1700s, there's always fraud at the beginning of an industry. But just to put it in perspective, FTX is in debt about $8 billion. The crypto industry is a $1 to $2 trillion industry. So although it was a big major scandal, $8 billion is a lot of money, it's very small compared to the size of the crypto industry. Yeah, to me, this is one of the most frustrating things because I, like you, believe in the future of Bitcoin and cryptocurrency. Um, and this is being portrayed as if it's a crypto scandal. And obviously, at some level, it is, right? It's, it's involving a cryptocurrency exchange. But in another way, cryptocurrency, Bitcoin, was created so that these things couldn't occur. If you sure. have self-custody of, of your Bitcoins, you don't have to trust a centralized exchange like this. And while it might be useful to, to purchase the coins, being able to protect them outside of the system was kind of why Bitcoin came about in the first place. There will always be frauds, but you can't be defrauded out of Bitcoin that you actually own. Right. And Stu, you bring up a great point. This was a centralized exchange, meaning there was one person, Sam Bankman fried who could take your money and do whatever he wanted with it. And the idea of cryptocurrency, and in fact, exchanges called decentralized finance exchanges that are built on top of cryptocurrencies, there is are zero cases of fraud because it's all an algorithm that everybody could see and determine if there's fraud or not. There's no secretive little group of 20-year-olds running around in the Bahamas doing things with your money. The idea of crypto is it's called trustless, meaning you don't have to trust anyone for it to work. You could trust the outcome will happen. Whereas a centralized exchange, you have to trust somebody. It's it's the antithesis of what crypto is about. And I'll note that Sam Bankman fried himself has said, I don't care if it's trading orange juice or crypto or whatever, I'll trade it. So he didn't really care about the crypto aspect. He just was making a lot of money running a crypto exchange. Yeah, it really is. Uh, it's, it's incredible. You brought up Enron a minute ago, and I think Enron's an interesting example. And it's it's kind of interesting to see how Sam Bankman fried is trying to get out of this. I mean, I've been watching these interviews he's been doing. And if you go back and you look at the, the Enron history, you kind of had three different levels there. You, Ken Lay was like the CEO, but he was the he was the figurehead. He was the president, I think, actually. But he, he was like the and, figurehead. And very politically connected, just like Sam Bankman fried Just like Sam Bankman fried in, in a way, he spent most of his time running around, hobnobbing with politicians and celebrities, and, and he kind of was the face of the company, but he wasn't really as much in, in the machinery of it. Jeffrey Skilling was, this, was the CEO, and he really was the guy who was there, and, and I think like got to that point where he felt like he was so smart, he could outsmart the system, and he could always find a way out of it. And if he had to bend the rules here and there, he would do that. But that would, in the end, it would play out okay. And then there was Andrew Fastow, who was the guy who was really implementing these things that were, in my mind, yeah. blatantly illegal. What, which one of those is Sam Bankman-Fried, or is he a combination of all three? He's a combination of all three. And what's really interesting, there's you, on every level, there's comparisons between Enron and FTX. You have a politi politically connected CEO. You have a CFO slash CEO who's doing things that are extremely unethical, 
but in a very gray area legally. Don't forget with Enron, a lot of these ex executives were offered plea bargains where they would have even avoided jail time, but they chose to go to court. And I, there was one uh, guy who worked for Andrew Fasto who got 20 years in jail. He could have taken a plea bargain. He chose to go to court, got sentenced to 20 years mm. in jail. And that it was such a gray area. There's a gray area here too, because what jurisdiction do we have over a foreign exchange in the Bahamas, which was completely unregulated. And we know hedge funds are unregulated and crypto is largely unregulated. I think for me, this is not, this is not, this is not to say buy, you know, watch out for crypto. There's all these frauds. Every industry has frauds, particularly, you know, in, in the industry. And that's unfortunate, but this underlines the need for regular regulation. There's a trillion dollars waiting on the sidelines from institutions waiting to put money into Bitcoin, Ethereum, and other cryptocurrencies, but they want to make sure they're protected. And hopefully this triggers Congress and other governments to, to do, let's say, positive regulation on crypto. And what I mean is don't ban crypto. The cat's out of the bag. Crypto's here to stay. But regulation that, you know, the know your customer, uh, you're not allowed to mix customer funds with, you know, risky investments, all the, all the stuff that exchanges in the United States have. Coinbase doesn't have this problem. That's a centralized exchange. And again, the decentralized exchanges like Uniswap and, and PancakeSwap and so on, they, they have none of these issues because they're built on top of cryptocurrency, which is trustless. Yeah, it's it's been interesting because I mean, I, of course, I'm I'm always skeptical and nervous about you know the government getting involved with any regulation. But you do feel like you know something something like Coinbase comes out of this looking a lot better as they have not oh, had these yeah. problems. And and as you mentioned, well, you decentralize Coinbase will be a huge beneficiary yeah. of this. Yeah, as will the decentralized exchanges. Like FTX was a, was a blip on the history of of crypto, but there are beneficiaries that are going to benefit. But even more fun is the fact that. They were having, it seems like Sam Bankman Fried was going out with this little girl who was running Alameda and she didn't know anything about finance at all. And she's running a $10 billion hedge fund. So there's, there's definitely a movie to be made here. Oh, it's going to be a good movie too. Uh, James, it's going to be a really good movie. Okay. Uh, we'll, let me, we'll go. Let, I'll, I'll buy the popcorn. Let's do it. Um, one more thing before you go. Another company that the, the, the government seems to want to regulate uh, all of a sudden is Twitter. Now, and, and this seems to be because they don't, I mean, they used to love Elon Musk because he was making electric cars and now they hate him because he wants, he is allowing people to speak. It's, it's very confusing. You had a really interesting thread though about what you think Elon Musk can do. Can you kind of give us a, a, you know, one or two minute break down of, of some of the main uh, points there. Sure. And, and, and yeah, you know, what is the problem, right? P people are having with Twitter. Oh, you're uh, suddenly allowed to say there is more than one medicine for COVID right. and <laughs> you won't get banned. Oh, we need to regulate this now. There's, there's too much free speech. Like I thought that I thought America is about free speech. That's what we all supposedly fought for, but okay. We're all behind a computer. I didn't fight for anything, but that said, <laughs> Let's look at Elon Musk's background. He, along with Peter Thiel and, and several others, started PayPal. They, they were the first ones to really you know, popularize the notion that you can pay for things online with a digital currency. Now, of course, that digital currency was the dollar then, but now we have a much safer, much more private uh, crypto, digital currency called cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin, Ethereum, and so on. And what I think the, his ultimate vision is and what he should do with Twitter is make crypto kind of the payment, the, uh, the default payment, make Twitter a, a, a payment platform for anything using Bitcoin or Ethereum or he likes Dogecoin, whatever coin he wants. I think that's his eventual goal for Twitter. And think about it. What, what if you can reward good content creators by having them earn Bitcoin by posting good content. And also the people who like that content could potentially earn some cryptocurrencies or people could sell things. Crypt Twitter could be a marketplace where people could sell things for cryptocurrencies. And I, I definitely see this is Elon Musk's background. He wants to make, he, he doesn't want to just have fun with Twitter. He wants to make another hundred billion dollars. He bought it for 44 billion. He'd like to IPO it for 150 billion. Tur turning it into a crypto platform is the pathway towards doing that. And this is very important. Crypto is hard to use. Like grandma mm. and grandpa in Main Street America is not going to suddenly 
get a crypto wallet and buy something called sushi coin on some DeFi exchange. And it, you know, it's just too complicated. I see Twitter as potentially being the first mainstream platform where crypto and Bitcoin are actually easy to use, easy to get, easy to spend, easy to earn money with. And there's all sorts of ways you could earn money in the tw Twitter ecosystem that no one's even thought of yet or, or approached yet. So I do think this is his ultimate goal. And when I, I wrote this on Twitter and he actually liked the tweet suggesting that this is the, the way he is thinking as well. Mm, that's really interesting. I, I do think that that is a, a big hurdle for crypto to get over where people can just use it easily. I mean, that's what one of the things Coinbase did. It made it uh, relatively easy to acquire, but still there's a lot there. And I think if, unless you're in this world, most people are intimidated by it. Something like this with Twitter could go a long way. Uh, James Altucher, he's an entrepreneur. He's a host, of course, of the James Altucher Show. Make sure to go and subscribe to his podcast wherever you can. Uh, James, thanks so much for coming on the program. I appreciate it. Stu, thanks so much for having me on. I really enjoyed it. Maybe someday in the near future, you'll be able to go on Twitter and get some stuff from Grip6 paying with Bitcoin. It could be the future. Yeah, Grip6 is out there. If you don't know who Grip6 is, they're a great company. They make great belts, wallets, socks. Uh, they're just fantastic. They're a small company in Utah. They uh, sell in the United States, but really all over the world. But they source almost everything they use to make their products right here in America, including like the wool for the socks right here in America. Uh, their belts are awesome. They're minimalist. They're not just jutting out of your shirt. You, they're customizable. You can get the carbon fiber ones. So you can go through the airport super easy. Uh, the, the socks are, you know, they're not like these. They're nice and warm in the winter, but they, they're not like really puffy and big. So they're too big for your shoes. They're just great, great uh, socks. And then, of course, the wallets are cool. If you've never seen a Grip6 wallet, it's different than the typical wallet you're thinking of. you got to check these things out. Grip6.com slash stew. Use the code stew. You get 15% off. Grip, the number six, dot com slash stew. Grip6.com slash stew. Get 15% off today. This show's been on for almost three years now. And if you had to kind of summarize the defining centralized points of this show, you might say Colin Kaepernick was not a good quarterback. Uh, you might say LeBron James uh, is the worst. You might say Andrew Cuomo is awful. Nancy Pelosi sucks. There's a lot of things we've put on shirts mostly, but generally speaking, you understand the themes of the show. One of the central themes has been since the beginning, since long before the show started, that Kanye West is insane. He was insane before he put on a red hat. He was insane after he put on a red hat. And that view really coming, I think, into focus today, maybe more than ever, as Kanye West went on the Alex Jones show. That's right. You're not Hitler. You're not a Nazi. You don't deserve to be called that and demonized. Well, I I see I I see good things about Hitler. Also, the Jew. I love everyone, and uh -oh. Jewish people are not going to tell me you can love, um, you know, us, and you can love what we're doing to you with the contracts, and you can love what we're you know what we're pushing with the pornography. But this guy that invented highways, invented the very microphone that I use as a musician. You can't say out loud that this person ever did anything good, and I'm done with that. I'm done with the classifications. Every human being has something of value that they brought to the table, <laughs> especially Hitler. Especially, not even as a second, especially Hitler. Look, this man is in massive mental health crisis and should be in a an institution. That's where he should be. He's blown up his entire career. He's blown up all of his relationships. He's blown up his entire life. He's, pr I mean, he is absolutely a danger to hurt himself or others. God only knows what's going to happen in this situation. I could say this. I've never indulged this nonsense when it comes to Kanye West. Uh, long before he was an anti-Semite, I still thought he was an idiot. I really hope at some point he gets on medication and can turn his life around. But this should, this should not be, and this should not be, uh, this, this whole situation needs to end. I mean, you know, obviously Alex Jones, I mean, when Alex Jones is not a conservative per se, but like he, you know, uh, conservative shows should stop putting this guy on. Stop feeding into this. It, you know, he went on to say, hey, um, what was the quote? Hey, by the way, every human has, being has something of value that they brought to the table, especially Hitler. Also, Hitler was born Christian. You don't put Hitler on your resume. That's not what you do. Hitler was also rumored to be a vegetarian at times. I don't say, hey, well, you know, at least Hitler was a vegetarian. That's not a good, you don't use him as a reference. And I will say, 
if you were able to put a three-person panel together and when you, f- you figure out a way to make Alex Jones by far the most sane person in the room, you have really accomplished something. You know, life is really the most important issue, isn't it? We can talk about all this other stuff. When we talk about keeping people alive, keeping people, giving people the opportunity to live their lives, whether they live an incredible, whether they turn into Albert Einstein or just some, you know, annoying guy at the drive-thru who screwed up your order, everybody has a chance to live, to thrive. That's the American way. It's supposed to be, at least. Now, we, of course, have Abortion. And abortion stops an incredible percentage of people from ever having an opportunity to live outside the womb. Preborn is here to reverse this. Preborn introduces mothers considering abortion to their unborn babies through ultrasound. Once they hear the heartbeat, once they know that that is a real life inside, 80% of the time they choose life. And Preborn continues to support these mothers after that choice with clothes, diapers, counseling, car seats, all so much, so much more uh, for up to two years. Preborn is completely dependent on you. And if you think about the end of the year here, a lot of people think about uh, where can I put my charitable dollars? May I recommend Preborn? Preborn, for just $28, you can rescue a baby's life. For $140, five ultrasounds. This is an incredible opportunity. And as you're thinking towards the end of the year, you should know, too, that through a match, your gift is doubled to preborn. 100% of your donation will go towards saving babies. Uh, So how do you do this? How do you join this effort? Dial pound 250 and say the keyword baby. That's pound 250. The keyword is baby. Or you can donate online securely. Preborn.com slash stew. Preborn.com slash stew. If I were to bring up the state of Maine, other than Susan Collins, what would you think of? You'd probably think Maine lobsters, right? Central to their way of life and their uh, economy in Maine. Well, uh, because of a lot of environmentalist nonsense, they are trying to regulate uh, the the lobster, the whole business, basically, uh, out of existence in Maine. And uh, this is actually pissing off Democrats in Maine. Now, the Democrats are there. Uh, They're kind of upset about this. And yet Joe Biden comes into town and has a fancy dinner with what? A bunch of lobsters. And the Democrat did not take too kindly to this. He tweeted out, if the Biden White House can prioritize purchasing 200 Maine lobsters for a fancy dinner, Biden should also take the time to meet with the Maine lobstermen his administration is currently regulating out of business. He went on to in an earlier statement to say we are. um, Excuse me. There it is. You cannot espouse being a president for working people while simultaneously overseeing the destruction of an entire blue collar fishery and its community's heritage way of life. He says in 2020, while running for president, Biden pledged, I will work to protect the livelihood and safety of the fishing community. He says he has yet to take a single action to make good on that pledge. Spicy, spicy lobster uh, up there in Maine. We'll keep you up to date with all the latest of lobster news. All right, one week away, uh, a little over that, I guess, for Power Hour. Uh, It's coming up on December 9th. Yeah, it's December 9th. Uh, The Stu Does America 2022 Christmas Party Power Hour. Shot of beer every minute for an hour as we try to talk politics with a great panel. We'll be introducing you to them uh, in, in, uh, in full over the next uh, few days before we get to the Power Hour. A lot of fun. You can be here in studio if you go to stewdoespowerhour.com. Also, as you're getting Christmas presents ready, get some insulting political stuff to give to your annoying liberal friends or conservatives you actually like. Uh, it's stewdoesmerch.com. There you use the code STU20, get 20% off everything on the site right now. Stewdoesmerch.com. The code is STU20. See you tomorrow.